Well, again, it's good to be back with everybody tonight, and I appreciate uh, uh, Ken and John for helping out in my absence on uh, Sunday, and we look forward to this study tonight as we continue on in the third epistle of the Apostle John. And we got into that about halfway through it this past week, and we want to continue with that. I will review just a moment because we should finish this tonight. We may even start in Jude. But right now, the book can be divided by, if you want to have a memory tool, by keeping in mind that, first of all, the whole letter is addressed to Gaius, who is a brother in Christ. But as you come down, and I haven't mentioned this yet, to verse 9, which is where we're about ready to go, we see another man, man introduced, and that's Diotrephes. And then coming on down to the end of the book in verse 12, you find Demetrius. Now that may or may not help you in remembering how the book unfolds, uh, but systematically it helps me to, to keep in mind uh, the, the very brief letter by keeping in mind how these uh, three men are introduced. Now, of course, the first is uh, Gaius. He's addressed affectionately by John, who calls himself the elder. And he says, I love you in the truth. And then he has this comment that uh, faithful brethren have given their testimony as to Gaius's continuation in the truth, walking in the truth. And he says, there's no greater joy than to hear that his children are basically faithful to the Lord doing those things that are in harmony with the truth of God. And then he admonishes him or exhorts him, or maybe both, that he do faithfully whatever he does. We mentioned last week that all of us, no matter how well we're living today, no matter how much Bible we know, how long we've been a member of the church, we still need exhortation to not let up. And you'll see throughout the New Testament and I mean especially those letters written to churches and individuals, that there's always some kind of exhortation to keep on keeping on. Don't quit. And, you know, we recognize that in about everything we do in life. It's not just a hit or miss type person that accomplishes much good, but it's the person that gets with it, does the best they can, and they don't give up. They simply keep trying. And this is what he exhorts him to do in verse 5. And uh, he mentions again that brethren uh, have borne witness of his charity. Now, that, of course, that covers a lot. We didn't spend a lot of time on that last week, except uh, that it is discussed in detail as to what charity is, coming from the Greek word agape. But Paul discusses that in depth in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and tells much about the attributes of this charity thus how it could be seen in another's life. Uh, simply summing it up in general, uh, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. American Standard says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So the true proof of one's love, the true proof of one's faith, one's confidence and trust, belief in Christ, is simply taking him at his word and acting upon that word in obedience to whatever is required by the Lord. Then he exhorts him to continue to help those who are busy in the kingdom. That's the best way to sum it up in a general way. Now, I reminded you then in the, the second epistle of John that he was warning the elect lady to be careful as to who she fellowshiped and who she sent on their way and indicated that you don't have to believe and propagate a false doctrine to actually be a part of its dissemination. Just simply support the one that does teach it. So here you've got in Second John the idea of don't even give greeting. Uh, don't do that, bidding him Godspeed. For if you do, you're a partaker of his evil deed. But yet over here with Gaius, what I've heard of you and being faithful and walking in love and this kind of thing, keep on doing that. Keep helping the brethren who are faithful. And we mentioned last week how that at that time, people traveling, how they traveled, 
They didn't know where they were going to be when it came night time. Many times, if you study history of that time, they traveled in great groups because uh, there were robbers all over the place. And just like the covered wagons of our pioneer days in America, they would travel together for protection. So when people came to nighttime and needing a place to stay, then this was a way that Christians could help other Christians as they were about the Lord's work in their travels. And thus, guys, is encouraged to keep on showing that kind of hospitality. So it, by the way, does show in each case in 2 John and then in 3 John that they were expected to be cautious. They were expected to be sure who they fellowshiped and who they participated in, who they upheld. Uh, so many times uh, over the years, I've seen people just not pay much attention to who they decided to support. There were no questions asked. You know, just assume since they were made, or at least they said they were members of the church, that you just do whatever you need to do. I don't guess we really think enough about the fact we have a right. I think it's more than a right. An obligation to God for the work of his kingdom and to faithful brethren to be sure that we are helping only those who are faithful. Thus, that means that overall we have to be aware of what's going on. We have to be aware of prominent, at least prominent false doctrines, and even who is spreading them. Now, you can't read through 1 John and 2 John and not see that he was greatly concerned about identifying false teachers, not being a part of them, or encouraging them in any way whatsoever. Well, if you look at verse 8 of 3 John, we therefore... Therefore means in the light of everything I've just said to you, we therefore ought, that's a moral law, it's part of being a Christian, to receive such. That is, to receive those who are busy about the Lord's business, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Now in Second John, you can see how you're fellow helper if you're not careful with a false teacher and therefore a partaker of his evil deeds. But here, we're to be fellow helpers of brethren who are faithful in doing the Lord's work and about his work, and thus we're fellow helpers with the truth. Thus he's saying we are in fellowship with those we help. To say that we're not in fellowship with those we help is simply to make no sense out of verse 8 of Third John. We may never see some brethren, but when we know and underscore the word know, that they are faithful to the Lord, then we can give them whatever support, monetary, otherwise. And thus, we are in fellowship with them and fellow helpers to the truth. Now, here's where he turns his attention, still addressing guys, and he starts from name call. And he says in verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. Well, I've often said, we don't know who Diotrephes was. He may have been a preacher. He may have been a deacon. He may have been an elder. He may have been a prominent church member of some sort. But there's one thing I know absolutely. There was a man who was a brother who was the name of Diotrephes. John knew about him, and he warns guys, of him. And this man in his warning, that is John's warning about him, serves as an example of how we need to be warned, even to the point of calling names. Now John proves this man's not what he ought to be. I know this too. He could not have exercised that kind of control over the church of which he was a member without the brethren allowing such to be. Some way, he had convinced them that his word, his view, was law. And thus, he was doing that. Now, I don't know whether this is um, early on apostasy of where one man was becoming the chief elder and later on in the second century called a bishop. 
But I know from what John said by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and warning Gaius of him that his name was Dr. Fees and he was doing what John said he did. And the problem he had was he wanted to be the chief man. He desired the preeminence. It wasn't just him and others who wanted preeminence, but he wanted to be preeminent, which means above anybody else. He wanted his way or else. Now, it shows you how far he's gone when he says that he won't receive these folks. But look at verse 10. John is saying, wherefore, in the light of the fact that he is this way and has acted this way and is continuing in this way, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Again, I say, he couldn't have this kind of power except the brethren some way or the other had been convinced that he ought to have that kind of power. So as we look at this, the first part of it is interesting. Wherefore, if I come, he didn't say I'm coming, but if I do come, I'm going to do something. I will remember his deeds. Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to get there and just have a recollection of what he had done that was wrong. What you're seeing is a, is a, a forewarning of I will exercise apostolic authority and apostolic discipline if I come. And this we don't see too much as we read the New Testament even when we're trying to realize what was going on in the first century church. And even as we understand that it was in the infant stage, and by that we mean it didn't have a completed New Testament. So they had to depend upon miraculous gifts. And the apostles, of course, were the ambassadors and are the ambassadors of the court of heaven. At that time, inspiration and direct revelation and guidance was in the apostles. To be an ambassador means they were in the place of Christ. And when they acted in their official capacity, then that was Christ acting. And they were able to do that because the Holy Spirit guided them in their official capacity to act according to the will of Christ. Now, if you want to see that again, go back to John chapter 14, 15, 16, where Christ tells the apostles of his going away and that he would pray the Father and he would send another comfort to them. And thus they would have the same association with the Holy Spirit that they had had with Christ. Say the Holy Spirit would be invisible. And Christ, of course, doing what he came to do to save us, must die and did. So no man could reach him, put him to death, resurrected, sends back to heaven. Then he sends the Holy Spirit. You read Acts chapters 1 and 2, especially chapter 2. And you see that they're baptized in the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. Thus, they are given the wherewithal that Christ promised them back in John 14, 15, 16, to be able to function as Christ called them to function with the powers of the Holy Spirit. So one of the things we're seeing here is that they did exercise apostolic corrective discipline. You can see this a little bit when uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas deal with Bar-Jesus on the island of Cyprus, when he tried to come between Paul and Barnabas and their teaching of Sergius Paulus. And Sergius Paulus, the governor of the island, described as a prudent man. He actually sent for Paul and Barnabas, and Bar-Jesus, other name is Elymas, tried to stop him. Well, what did Paul do? By a miracle, he caused him to go blind and described him perfectly as to what he was. Well, while that man was not a member of the church, the miracle he worked on him confirmed the word that Paul preached. And we find that Sergius Paulus was not, it doesn't say he was amazed at the miracle, it says he was amazed at the doctrine. The doctrine was confirmed to be from heaven and not from men by the miracle Paul worked. And in 2 Corinthians, um, what is it, 12, verse 12, he says in, in defending his apostleship against those who declared Paul was an apostle, Paul says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. 
So one of those signs we just described when it comes to uh, Sergius Paulus and that incident and um, Bargesa, of course. And now we're seeing that John would have had the same powers as would any apostle of Christ to discipline people in the church. If you read 1 Corinthians, where that um, he's warning them about the mistakes and sins they were engaged in, he tells, he asks them, do you want me to come to you with the spirit of love or with a rod? In other words, you can straighten this out. I'm giving you the wherewithal to correct your errors. Now you can do it, or when I come, I will. And I would never like to be the recipient of apostolic corrective discipline. And that's what John is saying here. Uh, get this in order, or if, if I come, I will remember what he's doing, and I'll deal with it. So he goes ahead to say what he was doing. He's using malicious words against him. Malicious words are words designed to destroy him. And that's what he was doing. He was telling all sorts of things that were evil concerning the apostles. And he wasn't content therewith, but he would receive brethren from the apostles. Now, what does that say about uh, how preeminent he thought he was that he wouldn't receive anybody sent by the apostle? But yet that shows you even in the days of miracles, people could reject what was obviously from God. And anybody that uh, knew that someone was being sent by an apostle to them should have been happy to receive them. <clears throat> You'll remember that uh, Paul would send Timothy places. He left Timothy places. Well, he even tells them sometimes receive him. Well, obviously, uh, John, whoever he told uh, to go and expected the church to receive him. But doctrines wouldn't. In fact, he worked right against him with malicious words. So he didn't receive the brethren and anybody that would have received him, he forbade them to receive him. And if they didn't do his will, he'd kick him out of the church. Well, this is a man who has nothing of the spirit of Christianity, who ignores the authority of Jesus Christ, who rejects the organization of the Lord's church and how it works. He just simply completely apostate. Now, Gaius needs to know about that. If Gaius, as a faithful member of the church, complimented and encouraged by the Apostle John, could be warned about this and even warn, warn him by calling a man's name, does that teach us anything about our operations today? Or could that only be done then, but we can't do it today? No, it, it also enjoins upon us the same love John had, the same love Gaius had, and the same concern for the truth and the church, and even the church where you had a doctrine things. So he says, beloved, follow not that which is evil. Well, he just described you the evil he's talking about. Of course, it would cover any evil, evil being that which is contrary to the authority of Christ set out in the words of the New Testament guiding us to do the will of heaven. So he says, you follow that which is good. So you have evil examples. You have good examples. You have evil people. You have good people. Now it's interesting here. These are members of the Lord's church. You got a good example, Gaius. You got a bad example, Diotrephes. And so John warns Gaius about Diotrephes after encouraging guys to make sure he continues to be faithful and to support and aid those who are faithful and thus be a partaker and fellow helper of the very truth other faithful brethren taught by assisting them. So, beloved, follow not what which is evil, but that which is good. Now, that also implies you've got to know the standard of right and wrong, the standard of evil and good, be able to to measure somebody to know whether they're teaching false doctrine or whether they're teaching the truth. Now, back in the Old Testament, the prophet Hosea said to the Jews, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How are they going to know what was true and what was false? And therefore, who was true in their teaching and who was false in their teaching if they were ignorant of the Bible? Well, they couldn't. 
So for what John, what the, the direction that John gives here could not be followed, they wouldn't know a bad example from a good example or vice versa if they didn't know the book themselves. And that causes us to realize again why Paul even told a rather learned young man who was dedicated, Timothy, to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, right in the divine word of truth. There is never an end to the study of the Bible. I don't care how much you know. You could quote the Bible in the New Testament in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. That wouldn't make any difference if you stopped studying it. Because the study involved is applying what you've learned in your life and continuing the study on top of that. It never stops. As long as you're able to study, you study. I know I have seen some people, some preachers, who reach a stage of life, they just about quit studying. And uh, they may think it doesn't show, but it doesn't. And I don't know of a way or anything that would take the place of study. So I can't exhort people enough to apply 2 Timothy 2.15 and to search the scriptures daily, as Christ said, to see whether those things are so. Uh, to be like the uh, noble Bereans, to study the Bible and never cease. First of all, the way we're constituted mentally, we can learn something and then it grows cold in our mind and we might need to be reminded. Well, we do. And by studying, we not only learn new things, but we keep what we learn fresh in our mind. And the only way to do that is just to keep at it. So this is one thing that would have to be for guys or anybody else at that time or this time to be able to apply such things as John is writing here. You've got to study the Bible to learn what's right, to learn what's wrong, so you can evaluate yourself, and that's where it begins, and anybody else they see whether they're teaching the truth. I think sometimes in some places people get in the pulpit as preachers, preach about anything, the brethren won't know it. Well, why don't they know it? They're not studying themselves. They don't recognize it. So there's a problem. Now, when he leaves, uh, about to leave verse 11, after he says, he that doeth good is of God. Well, of course, that good is living in harmony with the teachings of the New Testament, whatever it may be. And you know that our record is true. So he makes it clear. You know who I am. You know how I live. You know I'm an apostle of Christ. You know the place of apostles in the divine scheme of redemption and what we're doing. I dare say it's hard for us to recognize that when inspiration was in men as in the apostles, that we would listen to them as we would read our Bible to learn the truth. And well, now all of that has been transferred to a book. Uh, we still walk according to the apostles' doctrine as the early church did, Acts 2 and verse 42. But we simply read their teaching in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect, complete law of liberty, James 1, 25. So now he comes down and says, the third man appears. All of this letter, of course, addressed to Gaius, but he mentions Diotrephes. Now notice what he does. He talks about Demetrius. And he does the same thing with Demetrius that he did with Gaius. He says, Demetrius hath good report of all. Now, men supplied in order to make it flow well. That's what he's talking about. So, and of the truth itself. Now, you can't get a better recommendation than to be uh, have a good report from all and of the truth itself. How does the truth give a good report about a person? It can only be one way. That person is living in harmony with the truth, and people see it by the fruit born out in that person's life. By their fruits, ye shall know them. So that's what he's saying. And what he's saying is that's evidence to everybody that wants to know. So Demetrius has good report for all of all men. And of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record that ye know that our record is true. Well, that's a pretty good commendation. I don't know how you get much better than that. So here you have three men, the one to whom the letter is written, Gaius. We see how he's 
been described in his faithfulness, his fidelity to the Lord. Encouraged by John to continue in that. Then we have Dr. Phoebe, who has introduced two guys as somebody to watch out for. That he's deserving of being dealt with by apostolic authority. That he needs to be corrected. He's destroying a whole congregation. And now Demetrius, here's another one, Gaius, that you should look at. But he's not like Dr. Phoebe. He's a good man. And the evidence is in on him, and it's true that he's good. Then he begins to pull it all down to the end of the letter. I have many things to write, but I will not, with ink and pen, write unto thee. Well, my curiosity says I'd sure like for him to make it longer. I'd like to know what he had in mind, but that's not the way it works. So, verse 14, but I trust I shall shortly see thee. Now we know why he didn't write it all. He thought he would be able to see him in person. And we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friend by name. So we come to the end of the third epistle of the great apostle of love, the apostle John. I might mention over these three lessons, if anybody that's been in the class still has some questions, whatever, feel free to pose them at another time. We'd be glad to try to answer them as best we can. But we have some time tonight, and I think it's good to get on in then to what is the, actually the last general epistle, and that is the book of Jude. Jude's rather interesting. Uh, it's amazing how much can be said in, in a brief book like this. And he states right up front who he is, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Let's look at this a moment. Now, Jude in the flesh was a half-brother to Jesus Christ, as was James in the flesh, a half-brother to Christ, and a full brother in the flesh to Jude. But it's rather interesting, they never operate on that. James did, and neither does Jude. He doesn't mind saying that he's the brother of James, but it doesn't say, now remember, I'm a half-brother of Jesus, and I can tell you what he was doing when he was five years old, or he was whatever. And this, no, that doesn't enter into it, because he knows Jesus from the standpoint of the Son of God, his Savior, his Lord and Master, King of King, the Lord of Lords. And he's very much aware of the fact that he's writing by inspiration, as is all, or as are all of those who wrote by inspiration. So it's that Jew that is the brother of James, but notice the servant of Jesus Christ. Now, we must remember, too, we won't go back into that, but just to mention it, that the brethren of Jesus did not believe in him as the Messiah, the Son of God, until after his resurrection. Then they came to believe. And we're introduced to James pretty quickly, or at least in midway of the book of Acts, as being a pillar in the church at Jerusalem. Well, we come on down through here, and he says, you're sanctified by God the Father. Well, how are we sanctified by God the Father? Sanctified means set apart for a given purpose. How are Christians made Christians? That's how you're set apart. Well, you have to obey the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. The gospel, the glad tidings of Christ be brought through the preaching of the word to faith in Christ. To be taught the importance of repentance, Acts 17.30, confession of faith in Christ, Romans 10.10, 10, and the place where one actually becomes a Christian, buried with the Lord in baptism, and raised to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6.3 and 4, Colossians 2.12, Galatians 3.26 and 27. So, the Father, God the Father, sanctified, but notice, preserved in Jesus Christ. Well, I think we know what preserve is, kept, but not spoiled. Well, how are people kept, sanctified, set apart, faithful? And where are they kept? Well, they're kept that way through obedience to the gospel and through continuation of being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, which work is set out of the authority of the New Testament. 
Colossians 3.17. So here, we're able to see that they're in Christ. Now, you remember Ephesians 1, in verse number 3, says that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. And we're taught in Galatians 3, in verse 27, that the faithful are baptized into Christ. That's the only entrance there is into Christ. You can't be in Christ without getting into Christ. And the only doorway into Christ, so you can be in Christ, is to be baptized as a penitent believer into Christ. There is no other way. That's what the good book says. And it'll be saying the same thing on the Dead Judgment. And so we're preserved, according to Jude, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in Christ. So if I'm preserved in Christ, I need to get there so I can be preserved. And if I'm unwilling to obey the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16, I'm not going to be preserved because I can't get into the place of preservation. Thus, we're preserved in Jesus Christ. And notice, and call. Who are the call? The people who hear the gospel understand it from the heart obey it. Romans 6, 3 and 4, and verses 17 and 18. Nobody is in Christ except that they obey the gospel of Christ. To obey the gospel of Christ is, as I've just described, culminating in being baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ into Christ, where we are in a state of preservation because we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in Christ, wherein are all spiritual blessings in heavenly places located, Ephesians 1, 3. And that's forgiveness of sins being one of them and sonship, a child of God, who are in Christ. Now, he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Mercy unto who? Peace and multiplied, peace and love multiplied to who? Those who are preserved. Who are those who are preserved? They're those in Christ. So he tells them that by way of greeting them and identifying himself and reminding them in the greeting of who they are, how they got there, how they're to live. So we come down to verse three and he announces in a word of affection, beloved. But I gave all diligence to write unto you. In other words, this is not a haphazard thing. I was putting my all and all into it to write to you. What was he going to write of the common salvation? What does that mean? The common way people become Christians. The common teachings of the scriptures relative to being saved. Something, by the way, they would already know, wouldn't they? That reminds us what Peter had to say when he said the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So this would be something they already knew. And he said, I'm giving, I, I was giving all diligence to write unto you. My purpose and plan was to write of the salvation common to us all. But something happened. It was needful. Now, this is not a wish, it's a need. Something these people that Jude wrote to needed. They had to have it. It was necessary. They couldn't get along without it. That's a need. They couldn't function as Christians without what he's going to write. That's the force of the word need here. It was needful for me, Jude, to write unto you. And do what? and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. The American Standard says, once for all delivered to the saints. Now let me start the latter part of this before we get back to the first. Once delivered, once for all delivered. Now there are a host of people to this day and have been for many years who are constantly speaking and telling us that God talks to them. There are many so-called, or at least they're told, called that, it's not true, but it is, latter-day revelation. You've got the Mormon church. They couldn't exist with the Bible and the Babylonian. They had to have the Book of Mormon. And the, their other books where their doctrine really comes from is um, Pearl of Great Price and another one. But nevertheless, they all claim that came directly from God. 
that you couldn't get all you needed from the Bible, no matter how much you knew of it. To get people away from God, you have to get them away from his word. That's one way people do it. You then had, of course, have, of course, um, Mary Baker Eddy. She claimed a, re a, a revelation, a Latter-day revelation from God. You've got all sorts and sizes of Pentecostal people of some sort or the other, charismatic folks, they call them. And they're all claiming that God speaks directly to them. And that he is giving them direction. You hear some of these uh, preachers who've lost all conscience they're having when they had try to milk you out of every penny you got. And they'll tell you, well, God told me, I, I was just up the other night and God just started talking to me. And he told me I ought to do this and all that. Much of lies. No, nothing to that. And what is, how do I know that? Well, I know it for various reasons, but here's one of them in Jude. When Jude wrote of this faith, the faith, we'll talk about the usage of that in a moment, we have time. He says it's once delivered, and the American Standard more literally rendered it once for all delivered. There's not any other revelation coming. The truth had been revealed by the time Jude wrote this. That must be understood. But the day the church started, God didn't drop a New Testament down to everybody on that day. First Corinthians 13 tells us plainly that during the days of the miraculous working of the Spirit, the apostles with the baptismal measure of power of the Spirit, doing the work of the ambassadors of the court of heaven on earth, and all of those they laid hands on to impart miraculous gifts, all nine of them mentioned in First Corinthians 12, that the truth that is the New Testament came part and partial. And it was on the earth before any of it was ever written down. In fact, Jude's writing part of it, as John wrote the Gospel of John and the three epistles of John and the book of Revelation. The truth that's in those books was already orally here. Then, in time, all of the letters of the New Testament were written, embracing that truth that was originally called orally. Now, you see some of that on the very birthday of the Lord's church on that Pentecost, first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. Luke, by inspiration, records the gospel that was preached orally. And we have Peter's sermon as all the apostles stood up to preach on that Pentecost morning. But that was preached before anything was ever written down. So the totality of the New Testament gospel was preached and was taught orally, then it was written down. Jude's writing part of it down. But notice he says, this is common salvation already known to you. They had the truth before it was ever written. That was the way we need to understand that and understanding how we got the New Testament. So we have mentioned here then the faith which was once for all or once delivered unto who? The saints. The totality of the New Testament gospel was delivered orally as the Spirit guided everybody infallibly to speak it to the saints, first of all, to the members of the church. Now you read through the New Testament and you'll see that happen. Now the other thing that I would bring up here is that if it's been once for all given, uh, given it's, not, it's not any more to come. Now take this verse, go back to Galatians 1, where Paul makes it clear that though we are an angel from heaven, preaching any other gospel to you than that which we preach to you, let him be a curse. We talked about that last week. Which simply means this. The gospel in its fullness was taught to you. And anybody that teaches different from what I've taught, even if it's an angel, or even if there's another one claiming to be an apostle, he's a false teacher and you ought to be cut off. So the truth was on this earth. It was all of the truth on this earth in the first century. And then it was written down. And that's what we have as part of it being written here. Now, the faith is, it's interesting. The truth of God that saves us from sin, the New Testament of Christ, it can be called the gospel, the word, the faith. These are all terms using the same thing. The faith is actually, grammarians call it a senec. Doki. It's the neck doki, where a part stands for a whole or a whole for a part. 
And faith is such an integral part of the whole gospel system that is pulled out here and stands for the whole thing. And so John, uh, uh, Jude is saying that your job to be faithful to God is not forget that you put all your heart into contending for the totality of it or any part of it. There cannot be any deviation. You cannot allow false teachers to deviate from it. You cannot give them, and we see that from just our study in John, God's speed. You cannot participate. If you do, you're participating in it. You must stand up and contend. So it's teaching them that a part of their day-by-day -day living for the Lord and being steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord is to contend. Now, there's some of my brethren think that if it's the truth, you don't have to contend for it. It'll just win out anyway. Well, you can't find that. And that would go right against the very admonition of inspiration in verse 3 of Jude. Jude says the church must contend. Now, that's an important point to let sink in. You do what you can according to your several ability to defend the faith, to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear. That answer is apologia, to make a defense. And when you see Paul standing before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa, that's what he's doing. He's engaging in apologetics, I'm not saying I'm sorry, that's the way we use a apology in current English, but apologetics is making a defense. And you just go back with that in mind and read what Paul did, what he said, by Luke recorded by inspiration when he defended himself before Felix, Texas, and Agrippa. He was making a defense. He was contending for the faith. So when people don't want to contend for the faith, it's just that much of them is not converted to Christ. And they're just that weak because the truth continues with us as long as we fight for it to continue with us. Well, our time's getting pretty close to being up. And we'll just pick up here and continue to emphasize that we should earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, even as we go through the remainder of the book of Jude that has some quite interesting matters. Before we go, let's have a word of prayer. If you'd please uh, bow with me. Our Holy Father, we're so grateful for this avenue of prayer. As thy children, we humbly approach thy throne as our Heavenly Father, hallowing thy name and glorifying thee, asking thee to receive our petition, thanking thee in it for the time spent together this evening in the study of thy word. Help us to be humble before thee, ever saying, not our will, but thine be done, and laboring accordingly. Help us to study thy word, to retain it, to live it, to teach it, to defend it. Defeat us in evil, raise us up in good, be with the sick, the afflicted, and orphan, especially these in the household of faith. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.